In this video, we're going to be talking all about my bass tone in a modern and progressive mix. And we're going to do a head-to-head -head shootout between some of the best submission audio libraries and my Stramberg Bowden Prog 5 bass. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so now that we're in Logic, we're just going to take a quick look at a riff I wrote the other week. I retracked the bass today, and we'll take a quick listen to it and run through all of the things that I've done to process the DI. And this DI is my Bowden Prog 5 played by me. Not very well, but I tried my best. And it's a blend of the two pickups. So I retracked the bass today as I was filming this video, and the entire mix sounds like this. That's the mix that we've gone for. Let's just take a quick listen to the guitars and the bass on their own, and then I'll remove the bass and then I'll solo the bass. So you can kind of hear all of the parts that are in play and get a feel for it. Altogether, they sound really massive. I love how that sounds. The guitars are quite thin and they're out wide, left and right. I know that I've called both channels <laughs> Grand Out L and L. It is left and right, don't worry about it. It's I just forgot to name it. I usually do stuff like that. Uh, and that tone, if you want a full video on that tone and how I get that tone, let me know with a comment below and I'm more than happy to talk about my guitar tone. But I'm sure you can agree when I take the bass out, everything goes super thin. I get a fair amount of really kind comments that say stuff like, oh, the mix is massive, the guitars sound huge, how do you get that guitar tone? And I really, really appreciate those kind of comments, say, uh, what keeps me going. I think it's worth mentioning, a lot of the guitar tone is actually the bass tone. So it would be a little bit disingenuous of me to say, ah, oh, it's just the granifier. Because when you're hearing a video of mine that's like a full mix video, like this riff was, then to say that you'll get a sound accurate to what I've got in the video just by using the granifier and two guitar tracks isn't entirely true. So let's run through what's happening with the bass and delve into some of the moves that I've made and we'll take it right from DI all the way to final tone in a matter of minutes and I'll show you how to do that. So let's go. For this riff, I was using a blend of both bridge and neck pickups on the bass. On the original video, I used the bridge pickup, but for today's video, I decided to use a blend. If I go between both sounds on the Bowden, I really like the bridge pickup. It's kind of mid and throaty, but you get a lot of clarity in high end and a bit more scooped sound with the blended pickups together. So this is what it sounds like, just DI as I played it. It's not the cleanest take, but I'm not a bass player but I do love playing bass, it is really fun. So this is what that sounds like. <laughs> awesome, so let's have a look at the first plugin in the chain, and it is Parallax, of course it is, I love Parallax. This is the preset that I've made and it's basically what I've been using for the past six months or so, like give or take and maybe some tweaks here and there. So a lot of you will already know Parallax, but if you don't, it's from Neural DSP and it basically splits your DI into three EQ bands. So you've got a low band, mid band, high band. And what happens in the lows, you want to compress that a lot. You usually dial your compression in quite a lot, especially for this kind of music. At any point, feel free to just copy these settings, just write them down and then give it a go yourself. So yeah, compression's all the way, low pass at 175 hertz. And the low band on its own, I suppose, sounds like this. Cool, that's sounding good. Nice, solid foundation. That's what we always want from our bass tracks mid distortion let's put it on its own first and then you'll hear how it contributes to the low foundation that we've already got
And then let's put those two together. Some bass tones, you might even be happy with that, that sort of like high-end clank. The most curious thing that I find with Parallax is more often than not, I use the mid distortion to affect the highest frequencies, even though like the peak uh, is at like 300 hertz. It's so funny, I end up using the high distortion to act more of the mid-range filler. You'll hear that in a second, so let's take a listen to the high distortion. Now let's put the mid and the high together and hopefully you'll hear what I mean. So let's add everything together now so you can hear the full picture. And I've already had the EQ engaged for everything so far, so let's just take that off and you can hear the differences that it's been making so far. It's just helping shape a bit of the low range and as well as the top end as well, just taking a little bit of hair off that tone. Now let's talk about the IR. I'm not using the default IR in Parallax, but I will do a very quick comparison so you can hear what the default one sounds like. I'm using an IR from the big box IRs. I've linked that down in the description below if you want to check them out. It's like $10 or something if you want these. I just grabbed them because I remember a video of Nolly. He used this particular IR on his bass tone for Periphery 3. And it just helped me get that sound that I was hearing in my head a lot faster than trying to shape with a load of EQ like the original IR in Parallax. That's not to say Parallax's IR is bad. It's just I think it sounds very different. That will become apparent in a second when I play both of them. But I'm using the IR, which is the SVT810 EM10 with the 421 mic on the cap edge one inch away. And that is basically the same thing that Nolly would use on his bass tone. And it's going to sound different, even though it's the same IR, because it's a very, very different bass. So let's listen to the Dynamic 421 straight from Parallax and then compare to the third party big box IR. So you get a very different tonal palette depending on the IR that you use. You don't have to use the big box IR. As you could hear, the Dynamic 421 from Parallax sounds great out of the box. It just has a very different sort of tonal curve to it compared to the sound that I was after. I was after a much brighter, a little bit more honky IR that brought out a lot of the mid-range in the bass. So that's what I'm using but feel free to use your own IRs and see how you get on. So you could easily roll with that as your final bass tone. Everything's been compressed, the distortion's been handled correctly, and the IR only applies to the mid and the high distortion bands. I wanted to shape my tone a little bit further and carve out a few EQs and a few little rings and resonances that I was hearing. These three channel EQs that I'm using are quite particular to my bass. You might find if you're tracking a ding wall, or something else that you have different resonances, different things going on that you want to treat. Just take all of these EQ moves with a little pinch of salt, but still I wanted to show you what I was doing, so let's roll through them. So the first one is just treating a little bit of low end and a little bit of that low mid and mid range here at 500 hertz. So what I'll do for each of these is I'll play it without it and then I'll add it in. And then a lot of them you might not even be able to hear that much, but when you've got the speakers loud and you're in the studio, and you're trying to really dial in this bass tone, you'll be making really small moves just to try and maximize the potential of your bass tone. So this is EQ2. A little bit more tone shaping at the bottom, just boosting like by 1 dB from 128 hertz and below. Nothing really happening in the mid-range. 
But what's happening in the upper mid is I'm boosting 1k a lot. You'll find that when you want to hear those harmonics from your bass distortion, rather than boosting up here, which is what I see a lot of people do, try boosting around the mid range and you find this little pocket rail 1k where your guitar tone doesn't really do all that much. It is there, but you can kind of push the bass a little bit more in the center of the stereo field and you can really hear all of those harmonics pop through the mix. So that's what I like to do. Not to say that you can't push your high-end frequencies and really get away with it and it sounds really clanky but really nice. I just like doing this and I found that it's easy to handle all of the different notes that you might be playing in any given song by sticking to the high mids. So again, let's tick this out and then put it in. Hopefully you can hear the 1K kicking in the most. I'll do a little push and pull and you can kind of hear the differences that it is making. As I was showing you there, don't be afraid to push it. I could go even a bit further and it still sounded really nice, but I was happy with that there until we get to the third EQ where I pushed it a little bit more. So this one is a little bit more mad. There's a few resonances that I was hearing that I wanted to get rid of, as well as a little bit of build up at 200 Hertz that I just wanted to reduce and handle. So we'll go through this one in a little bit more detail, but again, this is very particular to my bass. I know that there's a massive peak at six and 3K whenever I play with distortion. You might not have many resonances from your bass DI, so just see how you get on, but this is the moves I've made anyway. So let's play it without and then put it in. I feel like that's just the final step, right? It adds so much more brightness to the high mids and the high end. But when I was doing that, we'll talk about the cuts again. Then I realized there's a few frequencies that are just whistling and permanently there. Like it's not note dependent, it's like distortion dependent. So what I'll do is I'll push both of these. You'll really hear them. And then I'll bring them back to neutral. You'll still hear them. And then we'll take them back out. So we'll do the 3K one first. just helps control those two little nodes of frequencies that are building up, especially that 3K, you can really hear that one. Let's talk about Sooth 2. Sooth 2 is a very expensive plugin. It's a very, very good plugin. If you don't have Sooth, I wouldn't worry about it too much. You can make these sorts of moves in an EQ. It's just more difficult, takes more time. I really enjoy what Sooth is doing to this bass tone. It's just handling, again, those high-end frequencies, but it's doing it more autonomously, so I don't have to worry about finding all of those little nodes of frequencies that are ringing out a bit extraneously. So let's check out what Sooth's doing. I'll start with it bypass, and then I'll put it in, and then I'll use the delta as well, so you can hear exactly what it is removing. So those kind of clanky, ringy frequencies, it's just taming those a little bit. I'm not going crazy with the depth, but I am in the hard mode and attack and release are set to fast. So just keep that in mind. It's not a necessary plug-in purchase. If this wasn't on the bass tone in the mix, you probably wouldn't notice it, but I'm just quite particular when I hear certain frequencies, I want them under control, especially if I'm going to be using something like this to make a longer piece of work, like an album or something. I want it to be as good as possible. Final plugin in the chain, other than the gains, which is just volume, is Double Tap from Submission Audio. This is an amazing bass compressor that, again, you can compress the low end individually, and then the rest of the compression can be handled in a separate stage. 
So the low end goes first, then it gets pushed into all of the compression. And you can even use a little bit of saturation to glue it all together. I usually use the grunt mode and then don't do much else. Main thing here is just watch out for these meters and you can see how much compression I'm doing to each band. So I'll start with it bypassed, then we'll put it in. Really not that much going on there, just a final little bit of glue really finishes off the bass tone nicely. And that's basically it. That's every single thing that I do for the bass tone. And from there, it goes to the bass bus, of which there's nothing on the bass bus. But then it goes to the instrument bus, which is just affected by my mix bus chain, but the entire mix is anyway. And then it goes straight to a flat line to just for a little bit of mastering. And then that's basically it, and that's the final bass tone. So the second part of this video, let's put my board into the test against a few of my favorite submission audio libraries, see how it stacks up and see how it sounds a little bit different as well. So all the bases have been tuned to the same tuning, including the submission audio libraries. It's basically just A flat on the second string. So the fourth string, they're all five string bases apart from Umansky bass. So it all sounds like an open A flat, just ringing out, very simple, nothing crazy going on here. All we're listening for is a few differences between the DI signals. And then what we'll do is we'll put them through my usual parallax preset and then just see how it sounds in the mix with just some drums, no guitars, just bass and drums. And you can kind of come to your own conclusions about which bass DIs you like. What I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna put all of the bass DIs in a Dropbox folder and link below so you can take a listen and kind of play around with tones if you like as well with these see how you get on but let's dive into it so let's run through each di in a loop i've named each channel what they are and i'll also put it up on the screen as well so you can see clearly but let's go <laughs> All right, so that's all of the bass DIs. They all sound really nice. They're all quite unique as well. I think my Bowden sounds quite a lot different to the Dingwall, but the Dingwall sounds quite a lot different to Umansky bass, which in turn sounds very different to Shin's bass. I think my bass is probably most similar to Umansky bass. There's quite a lot of high end in my DI, and there is quite a lot of high end in the Umansky bass as well. So all I'm gonna do now is the exact same thing with my default parallax preset on, and then I'll let you come to your own conclusions. So just to round out the video, let's add some drums, a very simple groove, just so you can get more of a feel about how each of these would sit in a mix. All right, let me know if you enjoyed this video and let me know in the comments below which of the DIs and which of the finished tones that you preferred. I'm sure there's gonna be some of you out there that love the sound of the Bowden or just love the sound of the Dingwall. 
or maybe even the shins base as well. They're all unique. They all have their own character. They're all amazing. So if you don't have a real base, consider picking up one of the submission audio libraries. They are amazingly versatile and really realistic if you spend the time to program them. With that all being said, I'll see you guys in next week's video. Said a bit.